You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. We're back with our first offering of 2021, The Trap, a collaboration between H.P. Lovecraft and the regular Weird Tales contributor Henry S. Whitehead. The story first turned up in the publication Strange Tales of Mystery and Terror in its March 1932 edition. We hope you enjoy this one, folks. The Trap by H.P. Lovecraft and Henry S. Whitehead 1. It was on a certain Thursday morning in December that the whole thing began with that unaccountable motion I thought I saw in my antique Copenhagen mirror. Something, it seemed to me, stirred. Something reflected in the glass. Though I was alone in my quarters, I paused and looked intently, then, deciding that the effect must be a pure illusion, resumed the interrupted brushing of my hair. I had discovered the old mirror, covered with dust and cobwebs, in an outbuilding of an abandoned estate house in Santa Cruz's sparsely settled North Side territory, and had brought it to the United States from the Virgin Islands. The venerable glass was dim from more than two hundred years' exposure to a tropical climate, and the graceful ornamentation along the top of the gilt frame had been badly smashed. I had had the detached pieces set back into the frame before placing it in storage with my other belongings. Now, several years later, I was staying half as a guest and half as a tutor at the private school of my old friend Brown on a windy Connecticut hillside, occupying an unused wing in one of the dormitories, where I had two rooms and a hallway to myself. The old mirror, stowed securely in mattresses, was the first of my possessions to be unpacked on my arrival, and I had set it up majestically in the living room, on top of an old rosewood console which had belonged to my great-grandmother. The door of my bedroom was just opposite that of the living room, with a hallway between, and I had noticed that by looking into my chiffonier glass I could see the larger mirror through the two doorways, which was exactly like glancing down an endless, though diminishing, corridor. On this Thursday morning I thought I saw a curious suggestion of motion down that normally empty corridor, but, as I have said, soon dismissed the notion. When I reached the dining-room I found everyone complaining of the cold, and learned that the school's heating plant was temporarily out of order. Being especially sensitive to low temperatures, I was myself an acute sufferer, and at once decided not to brave any freezing schoolroom that day. Accordingly, I invited my class to come over to my living-room for an informal session around my great fire, a suggestion which the boys received enthusiastically. After the session, one of the boys, Robert Grandison, asked if he might remain, since he had no appointment for the second morning period. I told him to stay and welcome. He sat down to study in front of the fireplace in a comfortable chair. It was not long, however, before Robert moved to another chair, somewhat farther away from the freshly replenished blaze, this change bringing him directly opposite the old mirror. From my own chair, in another part of the room, I noticed how fixedly he began to look at the dim, cloudy glass, and, wondering what so greatly interested him, was reminded of my own experience earlier that morning. As time passed, he continued to gaze, a slight frown knitting his brows. At last I quietly asked him what had attracted his attention. Slowly, and still wearing the puzzled frown, he looked over and replied rather cautiously, "'It's the corrugations in the glass, or whatever they are, Mr. Canavan. I was noticing how they all seemed to run from a certain point. Look, I'll show you what I mean.' The boy jumped up, went over to the mirror, and placed his finger on a point near its lower left-hand corner. "'It's right here, sir,' he explained turning to look toward me, and keeping his finger on the chosen spot. His muscular action in turning may have pressed his finger against the glass. Suddenly he withdrew his hand as though with some slight effort, 
and with a faintly muttered, Ouch! Then he looked at the glass in obvious mystification. What happened? I asked, rising and approaching. Why, it— He seemed embarrassed. It— I felt well as though it were pulling my finger into it. Seems uh, perfectly foolish, sir, but— Well, it was a most peculiar sensation. Robert had an unusual vocabulary for his fifteen years. I came over and had him show me the exact spot he meant. You'll think I'm rather a fool, sir, he said shamefacedly, but— well, from right here I can't be absolutely sure. From the chair it seemed to be clear enough. Now thoroughly interested, I sat down in the chair Robert had occupied, and looked at the spot he selected on the mirror. Instantly the thing jumped out at me. Unmistakably, from that particular angle, all the many walls in the ancient class appeared to converge, like a large number of spread strings held in one hand, and radiating out in streams. Getting up and crossing to the mirror, I could no longer see the curious spot. Only from certain angles, apparently, was it visible. Directly viewed, that portion of the mirror did not even give back a normal reflection, for I could not see my face in it. Manifestly, I had a minor puzzle on my hands. Presently, the school gong sounded, and the fascinated Robert Grandison departed hurriedly, leaving me alone with my odd little problem in optics. I raised several window-shades, crossed the hallway, and sought for the spot in the chiffonier mirror's reflection. Finding it readily, I looked very intently, and thought I again detected something of the motion. I craned my neck, and at last, at a certain angle of vision, the thing again jumped out at me. The vague motion was now positive and definite, an appearance of torsional movement, or of whirling much like a minute yet intense whirlwind or water-spout, or a huddle of autumn leaves dancing circularly in an eddy of wind along a level lawn. It was, like the earth's, a double motion, around and around, and at the same time inward, as if the whirls poured themselves endlessly towards some point inside the glass. Fascinated, yet realizing that the thing must be an illusion, I grasped an impression of quite distinct suction— and thought of Robert's embarrassed explanation. I felt as though it were pulling my finger into it. A kind of slight chill ran suddenly up and down my backbone. There was something here distinctly worth looking into. And as the idea of investigation came to me, I recalled the rather wistful expression of Robert Grandison, when the gong called him to class. I remembered how he had looked back over his shoulder, as he walked obediently out into the hallway— and resolved that he should be included in whatever analysis I might make of this little mystery. Exciting events connected with that same Robert, however, were soon to chase all thoughts of the mirror from my consciousness for a time. I was away all that afternoon, and did not return to the school until the 5.15 call-over, a general assembly at which the boy's attendance was compulsory. Dropping in at this function, with the idea of picking Robert up for a session with the mirror, I was astonished and pained to find him absent, a very unusual and unaccountable thing in his case. That evening, Brown told me that the boy had actually disappeared. A search in his room, in the gymnasium, and in all other accustomed places being unavailing, though all his belongings, including his outdoor clothing, were in their proper places. He had not been encountered on the ice, or with any of the hiking groups that afternoon, and telephone calls to all the school catering merchants of the neighbourhood were in vain. There was, in short, no record of his having been seen since the end of the lesson periods at 2.15, when he had turned up the stairs toward his room in dormitory number three. When the disappearance was fully realised, the resulting sensation was tremendous throughout the school. Brown, as headmaster, had to bear the brunt of it, and such an unprecedented occurrence in his well-regulated, highly organized institution left him quite bewildered. It was learned that Robert had not run away to his home in western Pennsylvania, nor did any of the searching parties of boys and masters find any trace of him in the snowy countryside around the school. So far as could be seen, he had simply vanished. 
Robert's parents arrived on the afternoon of the second day after his disappearance. They took their trouble quietly, though, of course, they were staggered by this unexpected disaster. Brown looked ten years older for it, but there was absolutely nothing that could be done. By the fourth day, the case had settled down in the opinion of the school as an insoluble mystery. Mr. and Mrs. Grandison went reluctantly back to their home, and on the following morning the ten days' Christmas vacation began. Boys and masters departed in anything but the usual holiday spirit, and Brown and his wife were left, along with the servants, as my only fellow occupants of the big place. Without the masters and boys it seemed a very hollow shell indeed. That afternoon I sat in front of my great fire, thinking about Robert's disappearance, and evolving all sorts of fantastic theories to account for it. By evening I had acquired a bad headache, and ate a light supper accordingly. Then, after a brisk walk around the mast buildings, I returned to my living room, and took up the burden of thought once more. A little after ten o'clock I awakened in my armchair, stiff and chilled, from a doze during which I had let the fire go out. I was physically uncomfortable, yet mentally aroused by a peculiar sensation of expectancy and possible hope. Of course, it had to do with the problem that was harassing me, for I had started from that inadvertent nap with a curious, persistent idea, the odd idea that a tenuous, hardly recognizable Robert Grandison had been trying desperately to communicate with me. I finally went to bed with one conviction unreasoningly strong in my mind. Somehow I was sure that young Robert Grandison was still alive. That I should be receptive of such a notion will not seem strange to those who know my long residence in the West Indies and my close contact with unexplained happenings there. It will not seem strange, either, that I fell asleep with an urgent desire to establish some sort of mental communication with the missing boy. Even the most prosaic scientists affirm, with Freud, Young, and Adler, that the subconscious mind is most open to external impressions in sleep, though such impressions are seldom carried over intact into the waking state. Going a step further, and granting the existence of telepathic forces, it follows that such forces must act most strongly on a sleeper, so that if I were ever to get a definite message from Robert, it would be during a period of profoundest slumber. Of course, I might lose the message in waking, but my aptitude for retaining such things has been sharpened by types of mental discipline picked up in various obscure corners of the globe. I must have dropped asleep instantaneously, and from the vividness of my dreams and the absence of wakeful intervals, I judged that my sleep was a very deep one. It was six-forty-five when I awakened, and there still lingered with me certain impressions which I knew were carried over from the world of somnolent cerebration. Filling my mind was the vision of Robert Grandison, strangely transformed to a boy of a dull, greenish-dark-blue colour, Robert desperately endeavouring to communicate with me, by means of speech, yet finding some almost insuperable difficulty in so doing. A wall of curious spatial separation seemed to stand between him and me, a mysterious, invisible wall which completely baffled us both. I had seen Robert as though at some distance, yet queerly enough he seemed at the same time to be just beside me. He was both larger and smaller than in real life, his apparent size varying directly instead of inversely, with a distance as he advanced and retreated in the course of conversation. That is, he grew larger instead of smaller to my eye when he stepped away or backwards, and vice versa, as if the laws of perspective in his case had been wholly reversed. His aspect was misty and uncertain, as if he lacked sharp or permanent outlines, and the anomalies of his colouring and clothing baffled me utterly at first. At some point in my dream, Robert's vocal efforts had finally crystallised into audible speech, albeit speech of an abnormal thickness and dullness. I could not for a time understand anything he said, and even in the dream wrecked my brain for a clue to where he was, 
what he wanted to tell, and why his utterance was so clumsy and unintelligible. Then, little by little, I began to distinguish words and phrases, the very first of which sufficed to throw my dreaming self into the wildest excitement, and to establish a certain mental connection, which had previously refused to take conscious form, because of the utter incredibility of what it implied. I do not know how long I listened to those halting words amidst my deep slumber, but hours must have passed while the strangely remote speaker struggled on with his tale. There was revealed to me such a circumstance as I cannot hope to make others believe without the strongest corroborative evidence, yet which I was quite ready to accept as truth, both in the dream and after waking, because of my former contacts with uncanny things. The boy was obviously watching my face, mobile in receptive sleep, as he choked along. For about the time I began to comprehend him, his own expression brightened and gave signs of gratitude and hope. Any attempt to hint at Robert's message, as it lingered in my ears after a sudden awakening in the cold, brings this narrative to a point where I must choose my words with the greatest care. Everything involved is so difficult to record that one tends to flounder helplessly. I have said that the revelation established in my mind a certain connection which reason had not allowed me to formulate consciously before. This connection, I need no longer hesitate to hint, had to do with the old Copenhagen mirror, whose suggestions of motion had so impressed me on the morning of the disappearance, and whose warlike contours and apparent illusions of suction had later exerted such a disquieting fascination on both Robert and me. Resolutely, though my outer consciousness had previously rejected what my intuition would have liked to imply, it could reject that stupendous conception no longer. What was fantasy in the tale of Alice now came to me as a grave and immediate reality. That looking-glass had indeed possessed a malign, abnormal suction, and the struggling speaker in my dream made clear the extent to which it violated all the known precedents of human experience, and all the age-old laws of our three sane dimensions. It was more than a mirror. It was a gate, a trap, a link with spatial recesses not meant for the denizens of our visible universe, and realizable only in terms of the most intricate non-Euclidean mathematics. And, in some outrageous fashion, Robert Grandison had passed out of our ken into the glass, and was there immured, waiting for release. It is significant that upon awakening I harboured no genuine doubt of the reality of the revelation, that I had actually held conversation with a trans-dimensional Robert rather than evoked the whole episode from my broodings about his disappearance and about the old illusions of the mirror, was as certain to my utmost instincts as any of the instinctive certainties commonly recognised as valid. The tale thus unfolded to me was of the most incredibly bizarre character. As had been clear on the morning of his disappearance, Robert was intensely fascinated by the ancient mirror. All through the hours of school— he had it in mind to come back to my living-room and examine it further. When he did arrive, after the close of the school-day, it was somewhat later than two-twenty, and I was absent in town. Finding me out, and knowing that I would not mind, he had come into my living-room and gone straight to the mirror, standing before it and studying the place where, as we had noted, the walls appeared to converge. Then, quite suddenly— there had come to him an overpowering urge to place his hand upon this wool centre. Almost reluctantly, against his better judgment, he had done so, and upon making the contact had felt at once the strange, almost painful suction which had perplexed him that morning. Immediately thereafter, quite without warning, but with a wrench which seemed to twist and tear every bone and muscle in his body, and to bulge and press and cut at every nerve, he had been abruptly drawn through, and found himself inside. Once through, the excruciatingly painful stress upon his entire system was suddenly released. He felt, he said, as though he had just been born. 
a feeling that made itself evident every time he tried to do anything. Walk, stoop, turn his head, or utter speech. Everything about his body seemed a misfit. These sensations wore off after a long while, Robert's body becoming an organized whole, rather than a number of protesting parts. Of all the forms of expression, speech remained the most difficult, doubtless because it is complicated, bringing into play a number of different organs, muscles, and tendons. Robert's feet, on the other hand, were the first members to adjust themselves to the new conditions within the glass. During the morning hours, I rehearsed the whole reason-defying problem, correlating everything I had seen and heard, dismissing the natural scepticism of a man of sense, and scheming to devise possible plans for Robert's release from his incredible prison. As I did so, a number of originally perplexing points became clear, or at least clearer, to me. There was, for example, the matter of Robert's colouring. His face and hands, as I have indicated, were a kind of dull greenish-dark blue, and I may add that his familiar blue Norfolk jacket had turned to a pale lemon yellow, while his trousers remained a neutral grey as before. Reflecting on this after waking, I found the circumstance closely allied to the reversal of perspective which made Robert seem to grow larger when receding, and smaller when approaching. Here, too, was a physical reversal. For every detail of his colouring in the unknown dimension was the exact reverse or complement of the corresponding colour detail in normal life. In physics, the typical complementary colours are blue and yellow, and red and green. These pairs are opposites, and when mixed yield grey. Robert's natural colour was a pinkish buff, the opposite of which is the greenish-blue I saw. His blue coat had become yellow, while the grey trousers remained grey. This latter point baffled me, until I remembered that grey is itself a mixture of opposites. There is no opposite for grey. Or rather, it is its own opposite. Another clarified point was that pertaining to Robert's curiously dulled and thickened speech, as well as to the general awkwardness and sense of misfit bodily parts of which he complained. This, at the outset, was a puzzle indeed, though after long thought the clue occurred to me. Here again was the same reversal which affected perspective and coloration. Anyone in the fourth dimension must necessarily be reversed in just this way, hands and feet, as well as colors and perspectives, being changed about. It would be the same with all the other dual organs, such as nostrils, ears, and eyes. Thus Robert had been talking with a reverse tongue, teeth, vocal cords, and kindred speech apparatus, so that his difficulties in utterance were little to be wondered at. As the morning wore on, my sense of the stark reality and maddening urgency of the dream-disclosed situation increased, rather than decreased. More and more, I felt that something must be done, yet realized that I could not seek advice or aid. Such a story as mine, a conviction based upon mere dreaming, could not conceivably bring me anything but ridicule or suspicions as to my mental state. And what, indeed, could I do, aided or unaided, with as little working data as my nocturnal impressions had provided? I must, I finally recognized, have more information before I could even think of a possible plan for releasing Robert. This could come only through the receptive conditions of sleep, and it heartened me to reflect that, according to every probability, my telepathic contact would be resumed the moment I fell into deep slumber again. I accomplished sleeping that afternoon, after a midday dinner at which, through rigid self-control, I succeeded in concealing from Brown and his wife the tumultuous thoughts that crashed through my mind. Hardly had my eyes closed when a dim telepathic image began to appear, and I soon realized, to my infinite excitement, that it was identical with what I had seen before. If anything, it was more distinct, and when it began to speak, I seemed able to grasp a greater proportion of the words. During this sleep, I found most of the morning's deductions confirmed, though the interview was mysteriously cut off long prior to my awakening. Robert had seemed apprehensive just before communication ceased, 
but had already told me that in his strange fourth-dimensional prison colours and spatial relationships were indeed reversed, black being white, distance increasing apparent size, and so on. He had also intimated that, notwithstanding his possession of full physical form and sensations, most human vital properties seemed curiously suspended. Nutriment, for example, was quite unnecessary. A phenomenon really more singular than the omnipresent reversal of objects and attributes, since the latter was a reasonable and mathematically indicated state of things. Another significant piece of information was that the only exit from the glass to the world was the entrance way, and that this was permanently barred and impenetrably sealed, so far as egress was concerned. That night I had another visitation from Robert, nor did such impressions, received at odd intervals while I slept receptively minded, cease during the entire period of his incarceration. His efforts to communicate were desperate and often pitiful, for at times the telepathic bond would weaken, while at other times fatigue, excitement, or fear of interruption would hamper and thicken his speech. I may as well narrate as a continuous whole all that Robert told me throughout the whole series of transient mental contacts, perhaps supplementing it at certain points with facts directly related after his release. The telepathic information was fragmentary and often nearly inarticulate, but I studied it over and over during the waking intervals of three intense days, classifying and cogitating with feverish diligence since it was all that I had to go upon if the boy were to be brought back into our world. 2. The fourth-dimensional region in which Robert found himself was not, as in scientific romance, an unknown and infinite realm of strange sights and fantastic denizens but was rather a projection of certain limited parts of our own terrestrial sphere, within an alien and normally inaccessible aspect or direction of space. It was a curiously fragmentary, intangible, and heterogeneous world, a series of apparently disassociated scenes merging indistinctly one into the other, their constituent details having an obviously different status from that of an object drawn into the ancient mirror, as Robert had been drawn. These scenes were like dream vistas or magic lantern images, elusive visual impressions of which the boy was not really a part, but which formed a sort of panoramic background or ethereal environment against which or amidst which he moved. He could not touch any of the parts of these scenes—walls, trees, furniture, and the like. But whether this was because they were truly non-material, or because they always receded at his approach, he was singularly unable to determine. Everything seemed fluid, mutable, and unreal. When he walked, it appeared to be on whatever lower surface the visible scene might have—floor, path, greensward, or such—but upon analysis he always found that the contact was an illusion. There was never any difference in the resisting force met by his feet, and by his hands when he would stoop experimentally, no matter what changes of apparent surface might be involved. He could not describe this foundation or limiting plane on which he walked as anything more definite than a virtually abstract pressure balancing his gravity. Of definite tactile distinctiveness, it had none, and supplementing it there seemed to be a kind of restricted levitational force which accomplished transfers of altitude. He could never actually climb stairs, yet would gradually walk up from a lower level to a higher. Passage from one definite scene to another involved a sort of gliding through a region of shadow or blurred focus where the details of each scene mingled curiously. All the vistas were distinguished by the absence of transient objects and the indefinite or ambiguous appearance of such semi-transient objects as furniture or details of vegetation. The lighting of every scene was diffuse and perplexing, and of course the scheme of reversed colours—bright red grass, yellow sky with confused black and grey cloud forms, 
white tree trunks and green brick walls gave to everything an air of unbelievable grotesquerie. There was an alteration of day and night, which turned out to be a reversal of the normal hours of light and darkness, at whatever point on the earth the mirror might be hanging. This seemingly irrelevant diversity of the scenes puzzled Robert, until he realized that they comprised merely such places as had been reflected for long continuous periods in the ancient class. This also explained the odd absence of transient objects, the generally arbitrary boundaries of vision, and the fact that all exteriors were framed by the outlines of doorways or windows. The glass, it appeared, had power to store up these intangible scenes through long exposure, though it could never absorb anything corporeally, as Robert had been absorbed, except by a very different and particular process. But, to me at least, the most incredible aspect of the mad phenomenon was the monstrous subversion of our known laws of space involved in the relation of various illusory scenes to the actual terrestrial regions represented. I have spoken of the glasses storing up the images of these regions, but this is really an inexact definition. In truth, each of the mirror scenes formed a true and quasi-permanent fourth-dimensional projection of the corresponding mundane region, so that whenever Robert moved to a certain part of a certain scene, as he moved into the image of my room when sending his telepathic messages, he was actually in that place itself on earth, though under spatial conditions which cut off all sensory communication in either direction, between him and the present tridimensional aspect of the place. Theoretically speaking, a prisoner in the glass could in a few moments go anywhere on our planet, into any place, that is, which had ever been reflected in the mirror's surface. This probably applied even to places where the mirror had not hung long enough to produce a clear, illusory scene, the terrestrial region being then represented by a zone of more or less formless shadow. Outside the definite scenes was a seemingly limitless waste of neutral grey shadow, about which Robert could never be certain, and into which he never dared stray far, lest he become hopelessly lost to the real and mirror worlds alike. Among the earliest particulars which Robert gave was the fact that he was not alone in his confinement. Various others, all in antique garb, were in there with him. A corpulent, middle-aged gentleman, with tied queue and velvet knee-breeches, who spoke English fluently, though with a marked Scandinavian accent, a rather beautiful small girl with very blonde hair which appeared a glossy dark blue, two apparently mute black men whose features contrasted with the pallor of their reversed coloured skins, three young men, one young woman, a very small child, almost an infant, and a lean elderly Dane of extremely distinctive aspect, and a kind of half-malign intellectuality of countenance. This last-named individual, Axel Holm, who wore the satin small clothes, flared-skirted coat, and the voluminous full-bottomed periwig of an age more than two centuries in the past, was notable among the little band as being the one responsible for the presence of them all. He it was who, skilled equally in the arts of magic and glass-working, had long ago fashioned this strange dimensional prison in which himself, his slaves, and those whom he chose to invite or allure thither, were immured unchangingly for as long as the mirror might endure. Holm was born early in the seventeenth century, and had followed with tremendous competence and success the trade of a glass-blower, a moulder in Copenhagen. His glass, especially in the form of large drawing-room mirrors, was always at a premium, but the same bold mind which had made him the first glazier of Europe also served to carry his interests and ambitions far beyond the sphere of mere material craftsmanship. He had studied the world around him, and chafed at the limitations of human knowledge and capability. Eventually, he sought for dark ways to overcome those limitations, and gained more success than is good for any mortal. He had aspired to enjoy something like eternity, the mirror being his provision to secure this end. Serious study of the fourth dimension was far from beginning with Einstein in our own era. 
and Holm, more than erudite in all the methods of his day, knew that a bodily entrance into that hidden phase of space would prevent him from dying in the ordinary physical sense. Research showed him that the principle of reflection undoubtedly forms the chief gate to all dimensions beyond our familiar three, and chance placed in his hands a small and very ancient glass whose cryptic properties he believed he could turn to advantage. Once inside this mirror, according to the method he had envisaged, he felt that life in the sense of form and consciousness would go on virtually forever, provided the mirror could be preserved indefinitely from breakage or deterioration. Home made a magnificent mirror, such as would be prized and carefully preserved, and in it deftly fused the strange whirl-configured relic he had acquired. Having thus prepared his refuge and his trap, he began to plan his mode of entrance and conditions of tenancy. He would have with him both servitors and companions, and as an experimental beginning he sent before him into the glass two dependable slaves brought from the West Indies. What his sensations must have been upon beholding this first concrete demonstration of his theories, only imagination can conceive. Undoubtedly, a man of his knowledge realized that absence from the outside world, if deferred beyond the natural span of life of those within, must mean instant dissolution at the first attempt to return to that world. But, barring that misfortune or accidental breakage, those within would remain forever as they were at the time of entrance. They would never grow old, and would need neither food nor drink. To make his prison tolerable, he sent ahead of him certain books and writing materials, a chair and table of stoutest workmanship, and a few other accessories. He knew that the images which the glass would reflect or absorb would not be tangible, but would merely extend around him like a background of dream. His own transition in 1687 was a momentous experience, and must have been attended by mixed sensations of triumph and terror. Had anything gone wrong, there were frightful possibilities of being lost in dark and inconceivable multiple dimensions. For over fifty years he had been unable to secure any additions to the little company of himself and slaves, but later on he had perfected his telepathic method of visualizing small sections of the outside world close to the glass, and attracting certain individuals in those areas through the mirror's strange entrance. Thus Robert, influenced into a desire to press upon the door, had been lured within. Such visualizations depended wholly on telepathy, since no one inside the mirror could see out into the world of men. It was, in truth, a strange life that Home and his company had lived inside the glass, since the mirror had stood for fully a century with its face to the dusty stone wall of the shed where I found it, Robert was the first being to enter this limbo, after all that interval. His arrival was a gala event, for he brought news of the outside world, which must have been of the most startling impressiveness to the more thoughtful of those within. He, in his turn, young though he was, felt overwhelmingly the weirdness of meeting and talking with persons who had been alive in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries. The deadly monotony of life for the prisoners can only be vaguely conjectured. As mentioned, its extensive spatial variety was limited to localities which had been reflected in the mirror for long periods, and many of these had become dim and strange as tropical climates had made inroads on the surface. Certain localities were bright and beautiful, and in these the company usually gathered but no scene could be fully satisfying, since the visible objects were all unreal and intangible, and often of perplexingly indefinite outline. When the tedious periods of darkness came, the general custom was to indulge in memories, reflections, or conversations. Each one of that strange, pathetic group had retained his or her personality unchanged and unchangeable since becoming immune to the time-effects of outside space. 
The number of inanimate objects within the glass, aside from the clothing of the prisoners, was very small, being largely limited to the accessories home had provided for himself. The rest did without even furniture, since sleep and fatigue had vanished along with most other vital attributes. Such inorganic things as were present seemed as exempt from decay as the living beings. The lower forms of animal life were wholly absent. Robert derived most of his information from Herr Thieler, the gentleman who spoke English with a Scandinavian accent. This portly Dane had taken a fancy to him, and talked at considerable length. The others, too, had received him with courtesy and good will. Home himself, seeming well disposed, had told him about various matters, including the door of the trap. The boy, as he told me later, was sensible enough never to attempt communication with me when home was nearby. Twice, while thus engaged, he had seen home appear, and had accordingly ceased at once. At no time could I see the world behind the mirror's surface. Robert's visual image, which included his bodily form and the clothing connected with it, was, like the oral image of his halting voice and like his own visualization of myself, a case of purely telepathic transmission and did not involve true interdimensional sight. However, had Robert been as trained a telepathist as home, he might have transmitted a few strong images apart from his immediate person. Throughout this period of revelation I had, of course, been desperately trying to devise a method for Robert's release. On the fourth day, the ninth after the disappearance, I hit on a solution. Everything considered— my laboriously formulated process was not a very complicated one, though I could not tell beforehand how it would work, while the possibility of ruinous consequences in case of a slip was appalling. This process depended, basically, on the fact that there was no possible exit from inside the glass. If home and his prisoners were permanently sealed in, then release must come wholly from outside. Other considerations included the disposal of the other prisoners, if any survived, and especially of Axel Holm. What Robert had told me of him was anything but reassuring, and I certainly did not wish him loose in my apartment, free once more to work his evil will upon the world. The telepathic messages had not made fully clear the effect of liberation on those who had entered the glass so long ago. There was, too, a final, though minor, problem in case of success, that of getting Robert back into the routine of school life without having to explain the incredible. In case of failure, it was highly inadvisable to have witnesses present at the release operations, and, lacking these, I simply could not attempt to relate the actual facts if I should succeed. Even to me the reality seemed a mad one, whenever I let my mind turn from the data so compellingly presented in that tense series of dreams. When I had thought these problems through as far as possible, I procured a large magnifying glass from the school laboratory, and studied minutely every square millimetre of that wool centre which presumably marked the extent of the original ancient mirror used by home. Even with this aid, I could not quite trace the exact boundary between the old area and the surface added by the Danish wizard. But after a long study, decided on a conjectural oval boundary, which I outlined very precisely with a soft blue pencil. I then made a trip to Stamford, where I procured a heavy glass-cutting tool, for my primary idea was to remove the ancient and magically potent mirror from its later setting. My next step— was to figure out the best time of day to make the crucial experiment. I finally settled on 2.30 a.m., both because it was a good season for uninterrupted work, and because it was the opposite of 2.30 p.m., the probable moment at which Robert had entered the mirror. This form of oppositeness may or may not have been relevant, but I knew at least that the chosen hour was as good as any, and perhaps better than most. I finally set to work in the early morning of the eleventh day after the disappearance, having drawn all the shades of my living room, and closed and locked the door into the hallway. Following with breathless care the elliptical line I had traced, 
I worked around the wool section with my steel-wheeled cutting tool. The ancient glass, half an inch thick, crackled crisply under the firm, uniform pressure, and upon completing the circuit, I cut around it a second time, crunching the roller more deeply into the glass. Then, very carefully indeed, I lifted the heavy mirror down from its console, and leaned it face inward against the wall, prying off two of the thin, narrow boards nailed to the back. With equal caution, I smartly tapped the cut-around space with the heavy wooden handle of the glass cutter. But the very first tap, the wool-containing section of glass dropped out on the bok horror rug beneath. I did not know what might happen, but was keyed up for anything, and took a deep involuntary breath. I was on my knees for convenience at the moment, with my face quite near the newly made aperture, and as I breathed, there poured into my nostrils a powerful, dusty odour, a smell not comparable to any other I have ever encountered. Then, everything within my range of vision suddenly turned to a dull grey before my failing eyesight, as I felt myself overpowered by an invisible force which robbed my muscles of their power to function. I remember grasping weakly and futilely at the edge of the nearest window drapery, and feeling it rip loose from its fastening. Then I sank slowly to the floor, as the darkness of oblivion passed over me. When I regained consciousness, I was lying on the Bokhara rug, with my legs held unaccountably up in the air. The room was full of that hideous and inexplicable dusty smell, and as my eyes began to take in definite images, I saw that Robert Grandison stood in front of me. It was he, fully in the flesh and with his colouring normal, who was holding my legs aloft to bring the blood back to my head, as the school's first aid course had taught him to do with persons who had fainted. For a moment I was struck mute by the stifling odour, and by a bewilderment which quickly merged into a sense of triumph. Then I found myself able to move and speak collectedly. I raised a tentative hand, and waved feebly at Robert. "'All right, old man,' I murmured. "'You can let my legs down now. Many thanks. I'm all right again, I think. It was the smell, I imagine, that got me. Open that farthest window, please, wide from the bottom. That's it, thanks. No, leave the shade down the way it was.' I struggled to my feet, my disturbed circulation adjusting itself in waves, and stood upright, hanging to the back of a big chair. I was still groggy, but a blast of fresh, bitterly cold air from the window revived me rapidly. I sat down in the big chair, and looked at Robert, now walking toward me. First, I said hurriedly, "'Tell me, Robert, those others, home? What happened to them, when I opened the exit?' Robert paused halfway across the room, and looked at me very gravely. "'I saw them fade away, into nothingness, Mr. Canavan,' he said with solemnity, "'and with them, everything. There isn't any more inside, sir. Thank God and you, sir!' And young Robert, at last yielding to the sustained strain which he had borne through all those terrible eleven days, suddenly broke down like a little child, and began to weep hysterically in great, stifling dry sobs. I picked him up, and placed him gently on my davenport, threw a rug over him, sat down by his side, and put a calming hand on his forehead. "'Take it easy, old fellow,' I said soothingly. The boy's sudden and very natural hysteria passed as quickly as it had come on, as I talked to him reassuringly about my plans for his quiet restoration to the school. The interest of the situation, and the need of concealing the incredible truth beneath a rational explanation, took hold of his imagination as I had expected, and at last he sat up eagerly, telling the details of his release, and listening to the instructions I had thought out. He had, it seems, been in the projected area of my bedroom when I opened the way back, and had emerged in that actual room, hardly realising that he was out— Upon hearing a fall in the living room, 
he had hastened thither, finding me on the rug in my fainting spell. I need mention only briefly my method of restoring Robert in a seemingly normal way, how I smuggled him out of the window in an old hat and sweater of mine, took him down the road in my quietly started car, coached him carefully in a tale I had devised, and returned to arouse Brown with the news of his discovery. He had, I explained, been walking alone on the afternoon of his disappearance, and had been offered a motor ride by two young men who, as a joke, and over his protest that he could go no farther than Stamford and back, had begun to carry him past that town. Jumping from the car during a traffic stop with the intention of hitchhiking back before call-over, he had been hit by another car just as the traffic was released, awakening ten days later in the Greenwich home of the people who had hit him. On learning the date, I added, he had immediately telephoned the school, and I, being the only one awake, had answered the call and hurried after him in my car without stopping to notify anyone. Brown, who at once telephoned to Robert's parents, accepted my story without question, and forbore to interrogate the boy because of the latter's manifest exhaustion. It was arranged that he should remain at the school for a rest, under the expert care of Mrs. Brown, a former trained nurse. I naturally saw a good deal of him during the remainder of the Christmas vacation, and was thus enabled to fill in certain gaps in his fragmentary dream story. Now and then we would almost doubt the actuality of what had occurred, wondering whether we had not both shared some monstrous delusion born of the mirror's glittering hypnotism, and whether the tale of the ride and accident were not, after all, the real truth. But whenever we did so, we would be brought back to belief by some monstrous and haunting memory, with me of Robert's dream figure and its thick voice and inverted colours, with him of the whole fantastic pageantry of ancient people and dead scenes that he had witnessed. And then there was that joint recollection of that damnable dusty odour. We knew what it meant, the instant dissolution of those who had entered an alien dimension a century and more ago. There are, in addition, at least two lines of rather more positive evidence, one of which comes through my researches in Danish annals concerning the sorcerer Axel Holm. Such a person, indeed, left many traces in folklore and written records, and diligent library sessions, plus conferences with various learned Danes, have shed much more light on his evil fame. At present I need say only that the Copenhagen glassblower, born in 1612, was a notorious Luciferian, whose pursuits and final vanishing formed a matter of awed debate over two centuries ago. He had burned with a desire to know all things, and to conquer every limitation of mankind, to which end he had delved deeply into occult and forbidden fields ever since he was a child. He was commonly held to have joined a coven of the dreaded witch cult, and the vast lore of ancient Scandinavian myth, with its Loki the sly one and the accursed Fenris wolf, was soon an open book to him. He had strange interests and objectives, few of which were definitely known, but some of which were recognized as intolerably evil. It is recorded that his two helpers, originally slaves from the Danish West Indies, had become mute soon after their acquisition by him, and that they had disappeared not long before his own disappearance from the ken of mankind. Near the close of an already long life, the idea of a glass of immortality appears to have entered his mind. That he had acquired an enchanted mirror of inconceivable antiquity was a matter of common whispering, it being alleged that he had purloined it from a fellow sorcerer, who had entrusted it to him for polishing. This mirror, according to popular tales, a trophy as potent in its way as the better-known Aegis of Minerva or Hammer of Thor, was a small oval object called Loki's glass, made of some polished fusible mineral, and having magical properties which included the divination of the immediate future, and the power to show the possessor his enemies. That it had deeper potential properties, 
realizable in the hands of an erudite magician, none of the common people doubted, and even educated persons attached much fearful importance to Holmes' rumoured attempts to incorporate it in a larger glass of immortality. Then had come the wizard's disappearance in 1687, and the final sale and dispersal of his goods amidst a growing cloud of fantastic legendary. It was, altogether, just such a story as one would laugh at, if possessed of no particular key. Yet to me, remembering those dream messages, and having Robert Grandison's corroboration before me, it formed a positive confirmation of all the bewildering marvels that had been unfolded. But as I have said, there is still another line of rather positive evidence, of a very different character, at my disposal. Two days after his release, as Robert, greatly improved in strength and appearance, was placing a log on my living-room fire, I noticed a certain awkwardness in his motions, and was struck by a persistent idea. Summoning him to my desk, I suddenly asked him to pick up an inkstand, and was scarcely surprised to note that, despite lifelong right-handedness, he obeyed unconsciously with his left hand. Without alarming him, I then asked that he unbutton his coat, and let me listen to his cardiac action. What I found— upon placing my ear to his chest, and what I did not tell him for some time afterward, was that his heart was beating on his right side. He had gone into the glass right-handed, and with all organs in their normal positions. Now he was left-handed, and with organs reversed, and would doubtless continue so for the rest of his life. Clearly, the dimensional transition had been no illusion, for this physical change was tangible and unmistakable. Had there been a natural exit from the glass, Robert would probably have undergone a thorough re-reversal, and emerged in perfect normality, as indeed the colour scheme of his body and clothing did emerge. The forcible nature of his release, however, undoubtedly set something awry so that dimensions no longer had a chance to right themselves, as chromatic wave-frequencies still did. I had not merely opened Holmes trap, I had destroyed it, and at the particular stage of destruction marked by Robert's escape, some of the reversing properties had perished. It is significant that in escaping, Robert had felt no pain comparable to that experienced in entering. Had the destruction been still more sudden, I shiver to think of the monstrosities of colour the boy would always have been forced to bear. I may add, that after discovering Robert's reversal, I examined the rumpled and discarded clothing he had worn in the glass, and found, as I had expected, a complete reversal of pockets, buttons, and all other corresponding details. At this moment, Loki's glass— just as it fell on my Bokhara rug from the now-patched and harmless mirror, weighs down a sheaf of papers on my writing-table here in St. Thomas, venerable capital of the Danish West Indies, now the American Virgin Islands. Various collectors of old sandwich glass have mistaken it for an odd bit of that early American product, but I privately realize that my paperweight is an antique of far subtler and more Paleogean craftsmanship. Still, I do not disillusion such enthusiasts. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the Join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.